My name is Dr. Michael Hewitt. Um, I'm a clinical research fellow based at uh, Imperial College London uh, at the St. Mary's Hospital campus. So um, my background is as a clinician, so I'm a gastroenterology registrar with a, an interest in the liver. Um, so I've joined a, a group at St. Mary's which has a, a strong interest in, in breath research um, and a background in mass spectrometry there. So given my uh, lack of expertise in mass spectrometry, I found the SIFT MS to be a, an extremely easy to use instrument. Um, it's very user friendly, um, it's been really e easy to use from the get-go um, and it's been great to work with. Uh, so events like today are, are really interesting to hear how other people have been using the instruments that we've been using um, to share and also invite collaboration between groups. Um, so yeah, events like this have been really, really useful. So my talk today was uh, entitled uh, Exhaled Volatile Organic Compound Profiling in the Context of Liver Disease. Um, and it's looking at the, the differences uh, in volatile organic compounds in the breath of healthy controls uh, versus those with liver disease. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Michael Hewitt. I'm also a clinical research fellow based at Imperial College London St Mary's campus, um, working in the same group as Bamini. Um, I'm working on a PhD towards looking at volatile organic compounds in the context of liver disease, um, sort of fitting in with our work looking at uh, non-invasive early diagnosis of uh, both benign and malignant conditions. Um, so I'm just going to touch briefly on the liver, um, the issue that we have in this country with chronic liver disease, um, breath testing in the context of liver disease and how we've been using the SIFT in our lab uh, to, to look at uh, liver disease, uh, the preliminary results that we've got and then some conclusions from it. Um, so the liver, as I'm sure some of you know, is a highly metabolic organ, um, lots of important functions in the body, clearance of toxic metabolites, production of clotting factors, production of bile, helps with digestion, um, amongst many other functions. Um, and in the UK, we're not doing too great with liver disease. It's not projecting particularly well, um, but you'll see lots of lines at the bottom sort of trending downwards, and that's the vast majority of systemic diseases. Um, but you may see just about a, an orange line slowly creeping up, which shows uh, the issue that we have with chronic liver disease in the UK. So um, it's, it's an organ that we're not doing too well with in terms of treating. Um, so there's been a 400% increase in mortality related to liver disease in the UK population since the 1970s, massive burden to the NHS, um, lots of reasons for it, um, alcohol consumption, um, increasing in fatty liver disease, so with the rise in obesity you get fat infiltration into the liver causing uh, fibrosis and cirrhosis, uh, and also viral hepatitis. Um, it can be quite difficult to diagnose, especially in primary care, um, there's unclear diagnostic pathways and often it presents very late, at which point it's very difficult to do anything about. In terms of how we look at the liver at the moment, um, we have so-called liver function blood tests, um, which have a sort of limited use. Um, they can be quite normal until the disease is very advanced. Um, we've got radiology, so we've got basic ultrasound imaging. Um, we've got transient elastography, which gives us a measure of how stiff the liver is, which is kind of a surrogate marker for fibrosis and cirrhosis. Um, and we've got magnetic MRI imaging of the liver, which is not particularly widely available, although it is useful. Um, and the problem with things like fibro scan is it's not that useful, um, the higher the BMI of the patient um, and there's a lot of interoperator inter variability um, with a lot of these techniques. Um, the sort of gold standard is a liver biopsy but this is pretty unpleasant for patients. Um, it can be painful, there's a risk of bleeding, there's also a, a very small but you know, significant mortality attached to it of 1 in 10,000. Um, volatile organic compounds. Um, there's a sort of work that's been done so far that's just been suggested that volatile organic compound profiles um, could discriminate people be between healthy um, and those with cancer. Um, and we wonder if the same could be applied to, to liver disease. Um, it's not a new concept. Um, ever since the time of Hippocrates, uh, there's been this concept of feta hepaticus, that patients with, with liver disease have a, a different smell to their breath. Um, and there's been several small-scale studies uh, done to date um, using different mass spec techniques um, that have identified different uh, compounds uh, of different levels within patients with liver disease, uh, so dimethyl sulfide, uh, some ketones, acetone, 2-butanone, 2-pentanone, uh, some terpenes, isoprene, uh, limonene uh, and methanol. Um, the theories behind a couple of those so far is that possibly sulfur-based compounds are due to incomplete metabolism of sulfur-containing amino acids in the transamination pathway, um, and ketones can be increased due to insulin resistance in the context of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Um, but there's, there's no huge consensus going at the moment about it. So in terms of what we did uh, based in our lab <coughs> at Imperial College, 
Um, we developed two methods um, looking at um, the compounds that have been previously identified in literature to date um, as being different in, in patients with liver disease. Uh, so ketones, sulfur compounds, terpenes, aldehydes, uh, ammonia, alcohols, um, alkanes and phenol as well. Um, put those together in two complementary methods. Um, we then recruited patients from the liver outpatient services at Imperial College London. Um, we're very fortunate that the, the liver unit is based literally next door to our laboratory, so getting patients in to, to use the SIFT has been very easy. Um, and based on their pre-existing results and expert opinion, they were divided into either healthy controls who had been referred for the, the possibility of liver disease but haven't actually found to, to show any liver disease, um, patients with liver fibrosis, so the sort of initial early scarring of the liver, and then patients with cirrhosis, which is sort of irreversible scarring of the liver. Um, all, all patients were asked to provide three deep exhalations uh, directly into the, into the SIFT um, using a disposable mouthpiece um, over a 60 second period um, and they did that for both methods. So it was a fairly quick, uh, quick thing for, for patients to be involved. We also completed a, a questionnaire sort of getting patient demographic details about them as well, what medications they were on, any other comorbidities that might skew the results. Um, so, so far we've uh, got 52 patients recruited, um, of those 30 have turned out to be healthy controls with an average age of 49 years, uh, 23 of which were male, um, 7 with fibrosis, um, average age of 59 years, um, 6 of which were male, and then 15 patients with uh, cirrhosis uh, with an average age of 60 years. Um, and then we looked at the results uh, via the Kruskal Wallace uh, test to see if there's any significant differences between those patient groups. So in terms of what we found, um, so one propanol was uh, an interesting compound where we've uh, got a nice sort of trend here where it's much lower in patients with cirrhosis compared to healthy controls um, and that did reach uh, statistical significance. Um, with phenol, um, we also saw a, a, a downward trend but unfortunately that didn't, didn't reach statistical significance but um, did show a general trend downward. Um, and then limonene um, showed an increased level in patients with cirrhotics compared to healthy controls, um, which did also reach uh, statistical significance. Um, limonene we're quite interested in. Um, a paper published in 2015 in The Lancet uh, by Fernandez del Rio et al. Um, was looking at volatile organic compounds in the context of, of liver cirrhosis in pre and post transplant patients. Um, and they had identified a significant increase uh, in, the liver, in the level of limonene um, in patients with cirrhosis. Um, limonene is an exogenous compound, uh, it's found in many common parts of our diary, particularly uh, found uh, commonly in our, in our diet, particularly citrus fruits. Um, it's metabolised by the CYP2C9 and CYP2C19 enzymes um, and uh, we know that CYP2C19 is reduced in patients with liver disease so that gives us a nice sort of reason as to why limonene would be higher um, in those patients. Um, so there is liver can't metabolise limonene as well um, and therefore it's higher. Um, some general feedback from patients was that they, they quite enjoyed it as a test, they found it quite novel, they found it interesting, um, they found it certainly much more pleasant than having a blood test or, or scan um, and it was pretty easy to use from their point of view. Um, another point to make, we were recruiting patients from all types of clinics, there was a, a variability in the amount of time that people have been nil by mouth. Um, patients attending for fibro scans were often kept starved in the morning, uh, but patients were recruited from general clinics, um, they had varying degrees of being nil by mouth or not. Um, and we found that if uh, we excluded patients that hadn't been nil by mouth uh, for more than four hours, um, there was some reduction in variability amongst the compounds. So for example, isoprene, um, the variability did reduce when we excluded those patients that hadn't been, hadn't been starved. Um, so just some conclusions. So, uh, Breath testing uh, via the SIFT was very acceptable to patients. They found it interesting um, and a sort of a novel way of, of tackling the diagnostic issue. Um, we've got quite small patient numbers at the moment, but it's shown some promising results with a couple of significant differences in compounds. Um, and we're continuing to recruit patients um, and hopefully we'll, we'll build on, on our data set. Um, and as I say, uh, user friendly and well received. There's some references which hopefully you should have in the handouts that are in the pack. Um, and yeah, thank you. Any any questions? Anyone got any questions for Michael? No, Mark. Well, I've got a question. Yeah. I've got a question. <laughs> um, 
One thing about breath tests, and it sort of follows on from what Yuri said for the last presentation, is that people breathe in different ways. Mm. And um, you don't get two people breathing the same way into the instrument. If you're not given a consistent breath into the instrument, you can get quite variability on the results. Mm. So do you have some sort of internal um, normaliser for these breath analyses? Not at this point, but it's something that we are aware of in terms of, yeah, the, the different phases of breathing can, yeah. can produce different results. Um, we, can, we can see quite nicely on the traces that are produced on the SIFT as to whether it's a sort of consistent breath yeah. um, and we do average it out over three results. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, no, it's something that we're aware of that we need to try and standardise amongst everything else. I think Yuri's idea about having somebody s drink something or eat something that's quite nice. Um, it was not an idea and I'm going to test it myself. Oh, you're going to test it? Well, there you go. No, no, yeah, no, no, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. going to do it. It just <laughs> came up to me when, when it was in the discussion. And yeah, yeah. Yeah, we have now like the flavoured water, mm -hmm. and I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to test it. We have a few customers doing this type of research mm -hmm. as well. And um, yeah, normalisation is, is, is yeah, extremely challenging you know, because you cannot spike a standard no. to, to, the, to the patient. I mean, another interesting one is that, again, I don't, I'm way out of my comfort zone in terms of what I understand about things, but I've, I've been led to believe that isoprene is, a, is, a, is also a stress marker, that if somebody is, is significantly stressed or more stressed, that their breath isoprene levels can be elevated. And if you're using it as one of your markers for the disease, mm. um, I suppose you could try to make a positive bit, but if the patients are finding the, 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 the testing quite straightforward and fun, maybe their stress goes down. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. I mean, again, it's one of those things where... I'm sure you know much, much more better than I do that breath analysis is obviously significantly complicated by... Do you have to like, kind of demonstrate to, to patients how, how to breathe into it? Yeah, often, often as straightforward as it is, as some patients do sort of struggle with the concept of how to do it and over what time frame. So often I will find myself <coughs> demonstrating to patients and then it generally, yeah, they get it. Sometimes we, we do a couple of attempts just to, yeah. to give them a practice and then... Yeah. And then go I for guess it. it. I guess it, uh, at least that's that's kind of, of helping it to yeah to, to yeah. yeah some kind of control over the, the the sample rate. I guess yeah exactly. Do you have a competition so you can breathe in for the longest without collapsing? <laughs> <laughs> We've not yet, but um, <laughs> I think I beat Bamani probably. <laughs> <laughs> Who's the fittest? Yes. <laughs> Hi. Yeah, for the p reference paper you have cited that. Collaborate, um, cooperated. They, they, your findings. They used a different method to measure the nimini, right? <coughs> yeah, it wasn't using SIFT-MS, It was using GCMS, I think. But I mean, I guess it was a kind of a case of they found the limini and then you were kind of the monitoring. Yeah. Were your patients all nil by mouth before you? No. So um, there was a, a mixture of whether they were nil by mouth or not. So. Um, yeah, so, so as part of the, um, we, we took a sort of food diary um, of all patients to see if they'd taken obvi anything obviously containing limonene. Um, there was someone who'd had lemon juice who had a, a sky high limonene level who we excluded from the analysis because it was clearly a, a, a contaminant. Um, but generally otherwise the results were kind of similar across the board in terms of the, the ranges of values that we were getting. Limonene is quite, quite widely used in lots of flavourings. Yeah. So yeah, we've... Yeah. We've discovered from our testing there. We've been surprised at what limonene is present in. Yeah. Um, interesting in that paper though, they did find that um, uh, despite what people's usual dietary intakes would be, even if they had a sort of higher than usual sort of limonene dietary intake, their levels weren't sort of significantly higher um, in healthy controls. I think a related point to that, of course, is that um, one area where sort of non, what well, you know, SIFT MS can struggle is, is speciating monoterpenes, for example, because mm. they all look fairly similar to the system. And so uh, there are other monoterpene flavour fragrance compounds that potentially could look like limonene mm. if you're not, if you're not, not aware of it, that, you know, I, I, obviously I can't, you can't say whether that was an issue or not, but it is one of those <coughs> things. Where yeah, it's something to be aware of. The, um, yeah, the speciation of, of monoterpenes is a stumbling block for many techniques based on the fact they're just isomers and all look the same. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions for Michael? No? Okay, cool. Thank Thanks you. Michael. Here we are. <laughs>
team now anyway, but we don't 